one of the other producers had some, some songs on the Chicken and Beer album. Nice. And of course, KL did move, yeah. you know, for that. Or what right. So he came back. He's like, hey, what, what else y'all got? Yeah. They're like, all right, we submit again for Ludacris, the next album, whatever it was going to be called. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, I got to get this track that I did yeah. two years prior. That's right. That's right. You know, on this or what have you. So it was like the last song on the CD. Nice. They sent the CD back, but you know, this was before, you know, you send tracks to the, to Dropbox or whatever, Dropbox right. or whatever we transfer or whatever. Yeah. Um, and us being in Louisiana, we FedExed everything. So you FedEx a beat disc, old oh. girl, what have you. And wow. I, I kid you not, it wasn't, but maybe two weeks, they're like, yo, Tick, they picked your track. Nice. I was like, what? So that was 2004. That single came out. I, we must have submitted it in May. And that single came out in December. Mm. Get back. Wow. Um, and so that was a two-year-old track. And I had refreshed it, you know. So, you know, when we resubmitted. I you decided, made some money on that track? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can we talk? Oh, can we talk? Can we talk? What's up, what's up? It's your boy, Ian Vaughn, and we're here for another episode of the Can We Talk R&B podcast. I'm super, super excited because we have a special guest today. This special guest is actually a friend of mine. We've been friends probably 15 yeah. years or so at this point. Yeah. Uh, he's a music producer. He is a multi, multi-instrumentalist. Uh, he has a pretty extensive uh, history in the creation and making of music, and above all, he is an R&B lover. So we're going to talk about music. We're going to talk about the state of the music business. We're going to talk about him, his, his uh, experiences, and so forth. So thank you all for tuning in. Mr. TikTok, Dominic Bazil. What's up, baby boy? Yo, how are you, man? I'm good, man. What's up? Well, thank, thanks for the invite. Yeah, man. Yeah. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you for, you know, taking the call. It's always good when you got friends that, you know, that make noise, and I'm able to say, yo, uh, my producer was like, hey, do you hear this guy named Tick to the Talk? I'm like, that's my guy. <laughs> like, what you talking about? Have I heard of him? Yeah. I told you about him. You know what I mean? So thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the invite. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with no further ado, we're going to get right into who you are. Who is who is Dominic Brazil? Like, like, tell me about, like, I guess the your love for music. Like, how'd you get started? Take, take me on that journey. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, me personally, I, I'm a lover of music musician um i mean it it, it you know it i bleed music it's sure. like yeah. it's, it's through the veins you yeah, know through and through and every aspect of it from this creation of music to putting things together um being a musician in bands and ensembles to uh helping to create musical products for other people to use to creating lessons doing tutorials online everything just revolves around music for absolutely, uh, and a lot of that just kind of began um, just here in New Orleans, uh, third grade, learning how to play saxophone. My, my parents and, and my family. I have five siblings, and my family is like everybody played an instrument. Yeah, yeah. So that I, uh, what, three siblings ahead of me, they're like, hey, Dominic, what do you want to play? And I was like, I think I want to play saxophone. Which my oldest brother, Craig. Play saxophone. I wanted to play the saxophone so yeah. bad. Yeah. 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 And I mean, I, I guess that was just kind of me looking up to my older brother. Sure. Uh, and he was leaving high school. So he was going to be, you know, he wasn't going to have a career, you know, in music or anything. He gotcha. was a visual artist. Okay. At the time. Uh, and so I basically, he handed me down his saxophone and yeah. that's how I started. So this, this, is, this is the third grade. This third grade. Okay. Starting on sax. Was this like a marching band? Like, did y'all have that? Uh, no, it was, it was like elementary school. Then uh, I went to Gregory Junior High okay. here in New Orleans. Big up Gregory. And uh, yeah, and marched in the in the band there, marched yeah. in Endymion and all the parades and nice. stuff like that. That was like life. And I just kind of fell in love with the marching band thing. Yeah. Uh, became a band head. Uh, and so I knew in, at college I wanted to go to like Southern because uh, the marching band, come on, you know? shout out to and, the jukebox, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and I knew they had like an engineering kind of program and whatnot, so you know, I was like, Oh, I could study computers and do like the marching band thing or whatever, yeah, yeah. and I'd be happy. I, um, things didn't work out that way or what have you, so I ended up moving to Augusta, Georgia, okay, and I uh, ended up going to high school, TW Josie, uh, marched in their band, which their band was patterned after 
Yeah, she do. Okay. So okay. my show, it was called uh, The Sonic Boom of the South. Gotcha. So we were like the high school version of The Sonic Boom of the South. Gotcha. Our band director, he graduated from JSU. Nice. Um, and so he kind of patterned our whole style behind that. And, sure. you know, it was it was super dope, you know, for especially for high school, what have you. We were kind of a powerhouse, especially for our size. Sure. Um, and so I played saxophone then, and then that's when I started getting introduced and so I played in the jazz band and Cornerstones, started... Cornerstones R and B. Right, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um yeah, I got into jazz band, started getting into jazz, became a jazz head. Yeah. Of course I was still into R and B. Yeah. And all other kinds of music. I uh, started learning about Earth Wind and Fire, Maze, yes. and you know, all the classics, Anita Baker. Um and then modern R and B in the nineties, that was about the nineties. So, you know, started getting to Brandy. Yeah. And yeah, uh, Tevin Campbell, of course. Joe to see. Of course. You know, Come on. and, and it's talk that talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh and for me, I mean, I'm a I'm such a lover of music. You know, I can't I can't I kinda jump from genre to genre. So I'm not just the R and B head, I'm not just the jazz head. I'm sure I'm a classical head. Yeah. I love score music. Um, I have a degree. So after high school, I went to Morehouse in Atlanta. Okay. Um, and so not Southern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and that's, uh, and that, that was just by happenstance. And I mean, you can blame great, it great on. Great school as well, for sure. Yeah, all, all great schools, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was kind of because, you know, paperwork issues. Are all Southern. <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, there. Okay, I, I'm not gonna bash, but I'm not gonna bash. Uh, no, I'm not bashing jacks, anything. But, but things happen for yeah, yeah, you know, for, a reason, for a reason. For sure, you know what I'm saying that was the reason. Or yeah. what have you? So, ended up putting in an application to Morehouse like two months before it was due, and nice. then I got my acceptance like like two weeks later. Nice. Like, hey, I'm that's to amazing. I'm going to Atlanta. That's amazing. Which uh, at that point, I was starting to get into music production. Nice. As uh, my brother, he had made. Um, ways in the industry in new orleans you know with okay. the hip-hop scene and whatnot yeah and got on board with no limit records so was he, he was a was he a part of beast by the pound yeah so he ended up being one of the founding members of beast by the pound nice yep, nice absolutely Big up. so um during the summers uh while i was at morehouse i would come down to baton rouge and hang around hang yeah. around the studio get acquainted with the equipment that's right the mpcs the a dads the o2r see a lot of people don't know no limit Obviously from New Orleans, but when they really started popping, they all were in Baton Rouge, right? My hometown, yeah, right, right, absolutely. So they, yeah, they had uh, relocated back to Baton Rouge, yeah. Um, and so the office was there on corporate, on corporate Boulevard. Know, I remember like that. this office space. I remember they had, they had they had the whole top floor. Yeah, 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 and they had yeah. different uh, rooms, and you couldn't couldn't operate really musically until after hours, so uh -huh. after six o'clock. That's right. You know, because of the building rules or whatever. And, you know, everybody in you know, it had banks and other kind of that's offices right. operating out of that's there. Right. So it's like you're trying to you know, have all these eight of weights bumping yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's not going to work for business. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, that's that's how funny. Kinda... No, no, that that yeah. just, bring me back because I remember that building. I remember when uh, T, T. Scott, you know, rest in peace, he brought us three, my old band. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. He brought yeah. us there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Go, go ahead. You continue. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, yeah, that's kind of where I got my ground you know, the, the foundations for music production. And I kind of already knew that that's what I wanted to do because in uh, me discovering jazz and in high school and college, I learned of, you know, producers. And I used to always read liner notes. Of course. Always see Quincy Jones. Yeah. And even like as a kid watching The Wiz and I discovered that Quincy Jones produced it and, mm. you know, did the music Come and on. scored the music. Come on. You know, I just kind of like, the dude I want to be. You know, I want to be the guy behind the scenes, That's right. you know, just kind of orchestrating everything, you know, so to speak. Quincy um, is that dude. Quincy, Quincy is the dude. Yeah. Quincy is the dude. Yeah. So um, I knew, I, I kind of knew, you know, from high school yeah. that that's what I wanted to do. So, sure. you know, coming down to Baton Rouge, learning the production equipment and how to record my first session, uh, my first, me cutting my teeth and recording artists was uh, mystical on uh, nice. a song for, I think it was for a Fiend album, what have you. Okay. And my brother, he, you know, he paid me some money or whatever, like, hey, go run the session. Yeah. And, you know, it was mystical. And yeah. you know how he raps. Absolutely. So it's like, you know, it's me trying to learn the equipment at the same time of just trying to catch his flow because he raps so, so fast. fast. Right, right. And it's like, all right, 
Run it back. And, you know, yeah, I, I'm trying to, you know, catch it. You know, I didn't mess up or anything. I, I might have missed a take or two. Yeah. But it all came out good. So, uh, so you just got right out to, like, with the big boys, understanding how to run a session. You know, you know how, yeah. like, you work, yeah, we yeah. work together. You know how I am. I'm like, yo, run that back. You're yeah. always on point. I'm always like, yeah, if you're looking for one of the dopest, like, you know, engineers in Baton Rouge, for sure, in, in the South, I would say go to my man TikTok. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so having the opportunity to work with guys like Mystical early on, I'm sure it helped right. that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and keep in mind, it wasn't computers back then. Right. We were still running, uh, it wasn't like analog tape. It was digital tape, the, right. the ADAS. That's right. So you still had to let it rewind. You still had to punch in at certain points. And yeah. if you wanted to erase something, you just have to rewind it and punch in at the right spot so that you don't re-record over something previous sure. and that sort of thing or whatever. So, gotcha. you know, uh, it's a different kind of workflow back then or what have you. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell these boys, man, this this new generation, they don't really know, like, the phases, right? Right, Everybody right. got Definitely. a studio on their laptop now. They don't understand, like, back in the day when you wanted to record, you had to go and you actually doing a whole session. Like, you're yeah. really recording for real. Yeah. So we'd be in the studio from... X amount of hours from three o'clock in the afternoon, four o'clock in the afternoon, all the way to midnight, one, two, three in the morning. And that wasn't just because it took that long. It's because that acts, the process actually right, took a little process, bit longer. Yeah. Sure. Sure. You put more time into the process. Uh, so it's more love, more dedication. You want to get it right, get it right at the source. It That's wasn't right. no fixing it in the mix, you know, That's right. strategy. That's right. It's like you have to, you know, get it right, it, you know, at the source, you know, yeah, at the, yeah. from jump sure. as it goes to the tape. Sure. You know, so uh, I definitely learned those aspects about recording, which still kind of stick to me, you know, with me these days or what have you. Yeah. Um, so what happened? Uh, so, yeah, in college, coming down, learning. Work with Mr. Whatnot, cool. Work with Mr. Cool. Uh, um, in college, I, I earned a degree in music composition. Nice. Because I knew I wanted to be that. Quincy That's right. Jones That's right. Dude, That's right. right? Um, and so I, you I, read music. You you do you do the whole thing. You know theory. You understand what's happening oh, yeah. across the board. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I took several classes of theory, orchestration, yeah. arranging. Yeah, that sort of thing. I used to arrange for the marching band. Yeah, you know, just kind of get those skills up and whatnot. So sure, yeah, definitely. Um, and I know I want to go on beyond that. Um, uh, I didn't because I started you know going more towards the production aspect. And for me, maybe the re one of the reasons why is that it's more of a quicker gratification type of thing. Sure. You know, whereas when you're writing uh, for an orchestra or what have you, you got to, you know, arrange it. You figure out what your melody is going to be. You got to figure out what your chord structure is going to be and whatnot. You write it out. You've got to arrange it and orchestrate it for the different instruments. Right. It's a process. Sure, sure. You know, and then you got to find an orchestra to perform it. Absolutely. Right. Right. So it's a process. So, you know, it's, which is a little slow and, you know, the gratification of, you know, the fruits of your labor. Right. You know, it comes a little, it takes a little longer a to get long. to that point. But with production, it's like, you, know, you can create a beat you know, in a couple right. of minutes. That's and right. you hear it and you're like, yeah, I, I hear, you know, so-and-so on this or I hear so-and-so on that. You know, are you talking about that? It, it makes me think like R&B music, the difference between hip hop, producing hip hop music and R&B music. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, obviously, we just programming a track up, making a beat. That's one facet of it. But with R&B, you actually have to massage it, right? It's kind of like, oh, yeah. you know, like you mentioned creating for an orchestra. You are, you are an R&B music, you're, you're cooking, it's like soul food. It's like, you got to prep the meal. You got to put it in the oven, let it wait a little time. You know, you got to marinate it when you set it right. before you put it in the oven. You know, I would say, and you correct me if I'm wrong, more hip hop production across the board, it's generally more like microwave, right? It's like a little bit quicker yeah, yeah. process. You don't have to worry about uh, certain vocals being a certain way specifically or um, uh, harmony arrangements, et cetera, et cetera. Talk yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I would say that it's a quicker process with hip hop. You know, typically you do a track, you can hand it over to, to the artist, the rapper, right. and they write their stuff. Right. And, you know, you go to town or whatever. Now, some some artists are a little more intricate. intricate. Sure. They know how they want certain things placed or what have you. They'll do their punch-ins and whatnot. Mm -hmm. or they know how hook is supposed to go or whatever or they might sit on it and then come back and finish it later you know type of thing but r&b yeah definitely is a little more nuanced yeah um you take your time with it you know um it's just got to be that right vibe right sure um lyrics definitely um 
and stacking and yeah. layering all right. the parts or what have you and getting right. all of those things in there. Yeah. Uh, do it again. No, um, do it again. I ain't feel that. I ain't feel that. I ain't feel that. I, 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 I feel that note. Do it, do it this way. Do, that, you mm -hmm. know, again, you know, type of thing. So it takes a little while. What's more, what's more fulfilling? You know, like I know for me, Absolutely. I love hip hop music. I love alternative music. I love gospel music. But there is no genre I love more than R&B music because R&B actually pulls from really all of those. But more or less, you know, I, I'd say it's somewhat of the bedrock of all of it. You know, so when we talk about jazz being like a cornerstone of uh, R&B music, uh, you think about the blues and then you think of soul That's music. That's why we call it rhythm and blues. That's why we man. call it rhythm and blues, right? right. You know what I mean? So, like, what, what, when did you first fall in love with R&B music? Trying, I'm trying to think uh, because I mean it's always been in me. It's always been there and yeah. around me. Even though my dad listened to jazz, he yeah. listened to WWOZ. That's all he listened. Yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would hear jazz. I might hear some extra stuff, some other stuff. You know, on particular days where they were playing like you know new age music or something. Like sure. Uh, my mom listened to the light rock station, yeah. so you would hear you know all the light rock stuff, Steely Dan or what have you, and mm -hmm. Hall of Notes, yeah, which is R and B to be honest. Oh, Hall of Notes is R and B, <laughs> right? I don't care what nobody says. <laughs> Hall of Notes is R and B. Kenny Loggins, that's R and B. Yeah, that's straight up. Straight right. up. Um, so again, it was always there, yeah. just presented in different forms, or what have you. And my sure. brothers and sisters, they would listen to different things. Gotcha. You know, on the radio, what have you. So I would always hear, you know, the Zap and Roger, or just different songs throughout the eighties. You know. Yeah. Um, before it got to where I could control what I actually consumed. Right. You know, because everything else was just kind of in the environment. I was just absorbing that, right? Gotcha. Um, and so getting to high school and learning about Earth, Wind & Fire and Maze and, you know, started, you know, all, all of the precursor stuff in the 80s when I was just absorbing the environment, um, that made me want to go find out who is Maze, mm -hmm. who, is, who is Earth, Wind & Fire. That's right. You know? Who are these people? Who who is Anita who is Baker? Maze? Only one of the best damn right. bands ever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Frankie Beverly and Maze? Come right, on now. Exactly. On. And so and then I started, you know, amassing my collection of CDs at that yeah. point or whatever. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and and really digging in, digging into the liner notes. That's what I was about. It's like who worked on this? Who played on it? That's right. That's you know, right. who's the bass player? Um, who who produced it? Who wrote the song? Right. You know, oh Diane Warren what? Uh, uh, what's his name? Can't think of his name. First right of now. all, you, we can't just skip over Diane Warren. Like, right? What? Right. If you love, come on. I can't even. I actually didn't even for for this particular show. I didn't even like dial in t to her in terms of her catalog. But all the, some of the best songs. I mean, I, obviously, I know some of the best songs Bro. ever written. Phenomenal songwriter. What, some of the best songs ever written. Man. Right. So, in terms of like. From, I mean, just, you know, I guess your inception, loving R&B music in the way that you do, or loving music in the way that you do. Talk to us about, like, I guess, tell us about some of the things that you've done. I know you did worked on mystical projects. I know you worked with Ludacris, uh, some some of that stuff in the past as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I don't you know my relationship with my brother and his production crew. Right. And they eventually left No Limit or what have you. Right. Uh, um after college, it was like, okay, well, they're starting their own production company, The Medicine Man. Yeah. Um, nice. And at that point, you know, I was playing saxophone, playing flute, playing clarinet, keyboards. Yeah. Dabbling on a guitar, dabbling yeah. on the bass. Yeah. So, you know, like Mr. used to say, call me uh, Mr. Instruments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played all the instruments. Yeah. Um, they're like, oh, yeah, tick, come on down. You know, we starting this company. We got some artists on the roster. Yeah. You know, we're going to put them out there. That we need your help. So graduated Morehouse 2002, came down, um, started working with them on, on different projects or what have you. Um, it's 2003, actually, I came down. In 2002, um, they told me, hey, we're about to submit for a ludicrous chicken and beer. Nice. Um, I was like, all right, dope. At that time, I was working with a buddy of mine who had some studio equipment. And so I was just kind of trying to crank out tracks. It's like, man, I got to get one. I got to yeah. get one. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. Now, mind you, you know, they're all more hip-hop oriented. So, you know, I was kind of the R&B guy, what have you. So, you know, it's ludicrous. It's going to be hip-hop. Of right? course. So 
Um, I missed the, the release for that. They closed the album, right? And so I held on to the track that I, that I had intended for them. And I had a couple of them, actually. Um, so for, fast forward to 2004. At that point, I had moved to Baton Rouge. And they were like, all right, yeah, Luda's asking for, because they had a couple of, one of the other producers had some, some songs on the Chicken and Beer album. Nice. And, of course, KL did move, yeah. you know, for that. Or what right. So he came back. He's like, hey, what, what else y'all got? Yeah. They're like, all right, we submit again for Ludacris, the next album, whatever it was going to be called. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, I got to get this track that I did yeah. two years prior. That's right. That's right. You know. On this or what have you. So it was like the last song on the CD. Nice. They sent the CD back, but, but you know, this was before, you know, you send tracks to the to Dropbox or whatever. Dropbox right. or whatever, we transfer, whatever. Yeah. Um and us being in Louisiana, we FedExed everything. So we FedEx a beat disc, over oh. or what have you. And wow. I, I kid you not, it wasn't but maybe two weeks. They're like, yo, tick, they picked your track. Nice. I'm like, what? So that was 2004. That single came out. I, we must have submitted it in May, and that single came out in December. Mm. Get back. Wow. Um, and so that was a two year old track, and I had refreshed it, you know. So, you know, when we resubmitted, I you decided, made some money on that track? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. You, no, so and the money comes in, in different ways. So, of course, you get, you know, your, your uh, um, your radio money right. through your ass cap and all right. that type of stuff. And right. then you get the actual points money. You yeah. Know, uh, you get points off the album. So that comes from Universal. That's right. Uh, still get those and what have you. And then uh, even beyond that, and this is important, publishing is so that song had been licensed for at least two movies and a couple of a few trailers. That's right. Okay. So when you, I think I remember you, that, that being on uh, uh, maybe any given Sunday, was it? Right. So it's on any given Sunday, and then uh, Tropic Thunder. Tropic Thunder. So at the end of Tropic Thunder, you see, nice. um, uh, which is crazy. Tom Cruise dancing to my song. You what? Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's he's crazy. dancing at the end of Tropic Thunder to that song. So, yeah. It's crazy. So you, I mean, that like name of stuff like that, just talking like to the producers. You know, this. I mean, R and B producers, hip hop producers across the board. You're able to, you know, I, I've known you, so you've been able to sustain and make a living from making music, you know, throughout all of this, all right. these years. Um, right now, like, what are you, like, what are you doing now? I want to talk about how you went from that to obviously sustaining yourself, working still as a producer and creating things. And I know, in terms of your social media presence, has gone crazy in the past couple of years or so. Uh, I want to kind of dive into some of that as well, like what led to that you know in terms of from the time you're you're riding away from the ludic ludicrous placements um and still you know making a living and getting some money from that stuff but at the same time staying active in music like what led right. you to the social media i know the eras have changed so what led you to that to get you where you are now yeah absolutely so the way the music industry works it's almost kind of like out of sight out of mind right and i figured okay well i'm living in louisiana i like louisiana uh, my family is here mm -hmm. and, you know, my kids, I want them to be close to family. So I'm going to stay in Louisiana. Sure. One of my plans was to go back to Atlanta, what have you, because, you know, you want to be on the scene. You want to be in the conversations. You want to be seen. Yeah. So that you can get the opportunities. Right. Right. Uh, well, I figured, well, I'll stay in Louisiana. You know, I got enough clout with, you know, the records or whatever to be able to reach out to certain people and me you know, trying to be uh, the Quincy Jones. I'm like, let me uh, get more into sync music. Uh -huh. So doing music for television shows, commercials, and movies, and that sort of thing. Right. Um, and I can do that from Louisiana. You know, technology is such, I can send yeah, stuff right. out. I can reach out That's to right. people and this, that, and the other. That's right. Uh, and so I did have a couple of opportunities for doing that, getting on some music libraries with Warner Chapel, um, which you know, shows up in commercials and stuff like that yeah. all around the world, uh, doing other music. For that's, that's the new record label. Right, exactly. Right. And then that's the better money, to be honest. Absolutely. Sync money. Yeah. And then uh, getting uh, placements with Real Housewives of Atlanta on nice. Bravo. Bravo, yeah. Uh, also Hammer Time, VH1, and nice. BT, some other stuff, what have you. So I was able to parlay, you know, the, the, 
success and to future opportunities, Absolutely. which is a lot more, you know, nobody's really talking about, oh, you did that track on Real Housewives of Atlanta or what have you, because it's kind of background music. Sure. But it matters because it's like every time that episode plays you get and paid. it gets in syndication, Absolutely. you get paid. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? And the more tracks you have, the more you're going to get paid. That's right. So that's, the, that's, that's what we call mailbox money. Mailbox money. Yeah. Definitely. For yeah. sure. Um, so yeah, all of that matters and it is, is good. It's good. Um, but on the other side, you know, you're not seen because you are playing that background role. That's right. Which is what I asked for. Sure. So I can't be mad. Right. Sure. Um, traditionally so, that's what the producers play really. Right. Traditionally right. before you had guys like dark child who would say tag himself or whomever, like right, he had right. certain, well, I guess Teddy Riley didn't necessarily tag himself by saying Teddy Riley. But you knew his, you knew his right. cadences, you knew his beats, you know what I'm saying? So you know, okay, this is the Teddy Riley track. Right. You know, so before that, producers generally kind of played the background. Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. So for me to, to get, uh, um, to do some of the things that I wanted to do, it was more of, uh, well, let me find some talent, you know, that I can mold and shape or what have you, or help somebody else be successful so sure. that I can be successful. Absolutely. Right? Uh, one of them was Justin Garner. Love you Justin. know, and we, yeah, and, and we, we did a lot of dope music together. We had uh, Justin, I'm going to have to get you on the, on the pod. Uh, yes, sir. Justin is like, yes, sir. Y'all may not know some, I know a lot of y'all may know Justin Garner and a lot of you don't. I'm telling you right now, Justin Garner is an incredible, incredible vocalist, incredible songwriter. He just, he dope, dope cat across the board for, from the whole town. Well, from Plaquemine, Louisiana. He's from Plaquemine, Louisiana. He's yeah. from Plaquemine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he's dope at marketing. That's the thing for independent artists before, you know, it was like a thing for independent artists to really kind of own the whole process or what have you. Yeah. He was doing it and he, he was, sure. he was leveraging marketing and, and making sure that, you know, he, his, his website looked great and he had the, all the PR stuff in place and That's this, right. that, and the other. And he really kind of, um, made that work for him. And you helped produce most, a lot, a lot of that music. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. So I want to talk about like when, you know, the social media started to really jump off and I know like I'm doing so much research. I mean, I'm an R&B head, so I'm always just listening to music, but I'm doing a lot of research. And when I pull up your stuff on TikTok or, mm -hmm. um, or on social, uh, first of all, when it came out with TikTok, I was like, I know a dude named TikTok. He already <laughs> making music, you know what I mean? Like he already yeah. making music. So you got on social media. And I, I mean, I remember us even talking about this, but you just like one, like it seemed like something clicked in it and it just, you just went through the roof with it, right? Um, is, is there some song you did uh, that you did? Tell me about that with uh, Coco from SWV covered it or jumped on it. I, so, you know, when we were all locked down or what have you, um, I had just started getting on TikTok. It was like 2019 yeah. and then 2019, that's when, you know, the whole world shut down, right? Um. And so I figured, okay, well, you know, everybody's stuck at home. Nobody can go anywhere. There's no shows happening, you yeah. know, this, that, and the other. Like, how can I use technology, you know, to bring what I do? Because I think it's cool, you That's know, right. and maybe somebody else. Will Absolutely. And so what I started doing was doing some beat breakdowns. Like, this is how so-and-so was made. I think I did. Lemonade was one of them. Um, another song was... Using a rain dance sample, da 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 da. So I did that. Nice. And what happened was, uh, Coco heard it. It well, that one went viral. So okay. it was like, well, I don't want to say it's like viral, viral, but it, it did some numbers to where yeah, Coco yeah. saw it. SWV saw it. Yeah. And so they had one a song. One of the coldest vocalists, period. Bruh. Coco, listen. Of so the hat says she jumped on the song. Like, how'd that make you feel? Like, what was your reaction to that? Dude, so that was... I know, that you, was, was nice. I know you was platinum so, all that already, but, you know. So that 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 kind of gave some validation to what I was doing yeah. on social media. Like, okay, this isn't corny. Right. Because at the time, I was, like, on a beat pad and pressing samples and making beats in front of people while right. looking at the camera. Like, it was, right. like, kind of... It was a little cringe or yeah, whatever. Yeah. But at the time, it was, like, one of those things where you have to grow through it. Yeah. You know? You don't just go through it, but you grow through it. Like, people watch you get better and better and improve on yourself sure. while, you know, you you're doing? on camera. Absolutely. Happen. And it's just one of those things you just have to do. Just get out there um, and do it. Right. And I, I, I tell people that it's like, you know, I'm, I don't feel comfortable when I do it. Even after I created the content, 
Sure. I'm like, should I even press post on this? Sure, you know? Sure. And then I, sure enough, I, th- I get my validation. I'm like, That's okay, right. yeah, it's dope. I'm it's one quick. of those things. It's like build it and they will come. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. You got to know your audience. I know me as an independent artist, I've made music forever. A lot of people know me. A lot of people don't. But the, I want to make sure that I build a foundation that's strong enough to when people come over, they're like, yeah. man, you really are. Yeah, you know absolutely. You know and what I mean? Yeah, that you definitely can see that. You know, I, I definitely saw that on TikTok and even Instagram because Instagram for a while, it took me the longest to gain traction on. Sure. But it's like when it did, when that couple of videos popped, it's like people saw all the other stuff yeah. behind, ahead of it. Yeah. You know, and then, so anyway, so yeah, that started conversations with Coco, you know, got on the phone with her and, you know, talked about some stuff or whatever. Right. Um, and then, you know, just going on, I mean, I, people would start to duet. So what she did was do a duet. Right. And so right. she sang the song that actually used that rain dance sample, that Jeff nice. Lover sample. Yeah, nice. Um, and so th- that was pretty dope. And then other artists would do it. Um, uh, it's run into a lot of um, singers, some who are professional, they sing backgrounds for other you know big uh, artists bigger artists and whatnot sure uh, and then you have uh people who just love to sing or they used to sing and yeah. now they just kind of you don't have a platform or nobody's giving them calls or anything That's like that right. and so at the time since everybody was locked up and locked in um they would do a duet so i decided well why not just make some instrumentals for people to sing to that's right you know and so i sing-alongs nice and there were other people doing that already but they would do it like you know with a piano or guitar i was doing full-on tracks it was like production right and even adding like background vocals as well sure sure so um that that one and then uh later on i decided okay well i need to find something that's going to work with the algorithm uh something that's going to be a little shorter so i started these riff challenges mm-hmm. and so it's basically all right i'm gonna play a riff from a famous song r&b song or what have you or a sample and then have people just identify it. How would you, like, in terms of, like, when you saw the growth happening, like, I think, I mean, I don't know, last time I looked, you were, like, at 600 some thousand on right. TikTok. Like, when you saw the growth happening, you know, the cool thing about it is most of those people are just, like you said, who used to be singers or people just grew up singing. They just love music. Yeah. A lot of these people are just fans of R&B some dope music. On it. For sure. Yeah, yeah I've, not, I've, I've watched a number of the videos. And you watch it and, just, and you're like, you know, we think about the music industry and you think about the particular artists that actually get an opportunity to really, you know, do it at this high, high level. But you don't, you can never forget about all the people who I believe are just the, the foundational pieces that keep this music even to, to keep the music alive because you have fans who just love the music. And then you have people like us who are musicians who want to sing the music or, you know, want to keep it going. So you have people like that following you 600,000 people out of that number I don't know how many are, are former singers or whatever have a, have a passion for it, but they all love R&B music so much so you're breaking down you're breaking down Hall of Notes you're breaking down Michael Jackson right. you're breaking down all these big records you know talk about like how that I guess changed or affected your uh I guess the trajectory of where you go where you are now I, yeah absolutely I, I mean what that does is basically it's almost like advertisement so it kind of puts me out there like going back to my statement, sure. you know, industry is like out of sight, out of mind. That's right. So this is put me back in sight, back in sight. Cause you look, you're hotter than a lot of guys. I like some of the other guys that we're going to be having on the show. That's big producers, big names. You are hotter than them. Like they have 10,000 followers, 50,000 followers. You have two over 200,000 followers on Instagram. You got 600,000. And then these are like real followers. Like this, these aren't right. bot followers. You know, these right. are, you know, the right, bots. Exactly. Right, exactly. Right, right. Not bots, for sure. Yeah. Uh, it's all genuine. I mean, and, and keep in mind, that's taken like since 2020, you yeah. know, to build that. And it's it's been waves to where I've, I've kind of reinvented the platform. It's like, okay, let me see how I can switch it up because, you know, I don't want people to get bored sure. and, and, and or think that I'm a one-trick pony. Um, when I have so much to offer, what have you. So Right. So they're able um, to see you break down. Take me down that line. How does that work? You sit down, you pick a song, like what inspires what R and B song? What's your favorite one, rather? So favorite R and B track that you've broken down, you know, you're like, I pulled up, you know, I saw you did uh which one I think it was like Mary J. Blige. It was uh I was like, I'm going down. It was one of uh, one of Mary's records I saw you do recently. 
um oh it might have been um uh, real, oh, real love real love so yeah yeah i did i did an actual breakdown of that because i have a youtube channel well one of my three youtube channels um is based around like music production and whatnot and i kind of posted it there but also kind of uh, and this was like 2020 or 2021 something like that but I also made a short form version of it to post tiktok yeah. and it's basically like okay, this is where the sample came from. This was the drum pattern used. This, you know, yeah. Um, audio two, um, top billing. Yeah. You know where it came from, and then they put this chord over it, yeah. and then it became, you know, so it's educational. It's educational. Yeah. And that's the thing about social media. It's like people either want to laugh, yeah, or they want uh, to give an opinion about something, sure, or they want to learn, yeah. So it's like I'm not really that funny, yeah. so. <laughs> I'm gonna teach people. That's right. That's right. I'm gonna teach people, and and honestly, that that's that's kind of a nurturing thing. Um, that's for part of me that's in me. Actually, sure. my mom's a teacher; has been a teacher like for decades. Nice, right? nice. Um, and so that's you know something I, I wanted to do. Um, to, uh, Is you, are you making money from it? That's people want to know. Are you? Making yeah. Money? Um, social media. I mean, from the platforms themselves. I mean, it's kind of dwindled a little bit. Uh, definitely Instagram did that thing where they kind of took away all monetization on reels. Really? Yeah. Uh, and all they made it like a little bit. I mean, in the numbers I'm doing now, I'm like, man, I would have been killing it. Like, yeah. Oh, wow. Um, when did they change? That was like early in the year. Okay. Yeah. Early this year. Yeah. I was not aware of that. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then uh, TikTok, it still goes you know, somewhat. It's not like crazy numbers. But it's mailbox but money. It's, just it's like, mailbox money. It's, it's rainy day money, sure, to be honest. Sure. So it's just money. I just kind of leave there and cash out, you know, if I want to get some new equipment or buy some software. But that's the thing. Look, as a musician, if you're making money, we got so many musicians out here just gigging. That's all they're doing. They're making whatever they make, three, four hundred dollars right. a gig. So if you have live, live events going on, you have, uh, you know, opportunities like social media, a multiple streams of income coming in, being active in music. That's impressive. So like, what do you, like right now, I know you're working with Personas um, as a project manager with them or product manager. Product manager, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, and so that's, that's kind of a full circle type of thing because when I was in college, you know, and wanting to study computer and then merge that with music, um, that was me just kind of want to be, you know, in tech and in music, yeah. you know, at the same time as my like career and my passion. Now you're in tech and in music and social media and everything. Right. That's, exactly. That's, and that's then at Personas, hard. I helped develop the products that people use to create music. Nice. You know, what's some so, of the biggest products? I know Studio One is like big software. Uh, yeah, Studio One is, is, the, is the DAW software yeah. that we develop. You know, it's, it's akin to Pro Tools and Logic or what have you. It's right. my preference. I yeah. moved from Pro Tools to Studio One just because of the workflow. It's easier for me. Yeah. Works for me. Sounds great. Um, Isn't Teddy Riley? Like, that's his... I, yeah, that's yeah, his, yeah. His I actually met Teddy through Personas a couple nice. of times. I've been on the calls with him, you know, help with certain issues or whatever. And, nice. And stuff. Um, met Tim and Bob, too. Through, we got to get Tim, Tim and Bob. We got to get Tim and Bob on the show. Look. Yeah, so underrated. Tim Kelly, my guy. I know Please. I follow I follow I follow Please. Tim on Instagram. I tell I think I tell uh, Bob as well. I need y'all on the on the Can We Talk R&B podcast because those guys were very instrumental in some of my favorite artists. You know Joe, I need you on the show. Oh, yeah. You know I mean so many different guys. Obviously Bobby Valentino. Bobby. I mean they got so many records that they're popular from. But I you know Cisco. Uh, Cisco, come on man. Boys to man, if you want to go back that Absolutely. Far. Oh, we're going to go as far back as we can go. <laughs> no, Tim and Bob, no, big shout out to them for sure. Yeah. Got to get them on One the of show. my favorites, for sure. Yeah, for sure. So we talk about favorites. Let's get into this. Okay. Oh. So we talk about like the best or your favorite, not just best, because that, you know, we all. You know, okay, cool. That, that cool. turned that, into that, a whole that, thing. That, that turned into a thing. Right, but give exactly. me your top five R&B albums. Whew. Five R R&B albums. Oh. Um, That'd be something from the Stevie catalog. So. Okay. Um, I'm down, I can't, I can't, Pull it out. I couldn't remember. All Pull it out. I know that's so difficult. It's, 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 it wins because I had to look. I was like, man. We almost have to break it down by 
like decades or something like that. Yeah, you know really. I'm we had to figure that out. So just your five top five albums. Like so I chose the original Music Aquarium for, for Steven. Yeah. <sighs> Man. What song from that one like is the one that said, okay. Well, Ribbon in the Sky was like one of the, you know. Classic. You know what I mean? I've sang Ribbon in the Sky at probably, probably a hundred. I'm not even exaggerating. Probably a hundred ways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's probably one of the first songs I, I, I I'll play if I just sat down at a piano. You know what I'm saying? Bruh, it's so good. It's so good. Oh, well, my God. Come on, Stevie. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, um, Anita Baker, Rapshin. Okay. That album, I mean, yes. it's it's like it changed, you know, you could think of what R&B was because it's jazzy, too, at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And then it was just so different. It was... um the chord progressions and just approach to R&B. Sure. You know? Sure. And then the songs themselves are good. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's just one of those. that And, and that speaks to my jazz and my R&B. Side. Absolutely. 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 You, Super dope. You two for two. You, you hitting. What, what else you got? Um, All right. In the 90s, there's so many. There's so many. I wanted to put Jodeci on there somewhere. I said... Never say never. Brandy. Brandy. Come on. Um, the first album, I, I love that album, but when Never Say Never that came was the out, album. it was so different. And that's you what know, year was that? That was 97? Yeah. 97? Like 96, 97. Yeah, yeah. 97, 97. And it was it was you know, it's the production, the syncopation that Rodney Jerkins yeah, bro. you know, did. And then you know, her getting into the whole layering thing. Yeah. And of her vocals, sure, and all those little intricate things. Yeah, the Just songwriting of Sean Daniel. Well, oh, Sean Daniel, Bry, Lashawn. Bri. Those songs were so good. Big Shiz, big R.I.P. to the brother. I yeah, mean, absolutely. yeah, man, that was one of my my favorite songwriters as well. Yeah, that's that's like one of my favorite albums by her. Even you know, over the ones that came after, where she even went even you know beyond that. Sure, sure. You know, so that's three. Those are three really hard albums to beat. What else you got? Um, I had to put Confessions on there because that's just a masterpiece. Agreed. That's just a masterpiece from top to bottom. That's like, funny. You, there's no skips. Look, it's funny. Okay. We're not, we're not, look, Usher is one of my favorites. And the Confessions album, I believe, if his catalog is probably his best album, right? Album. I mean, he has other right. fantastic songs as well. Right, right, right. He's Usher. He's a he's one of the ghosts. Definitely of our generation. When Confessions came, Usher like st- stuck his he stuck his flag and down like letting everybody know that it was him that he was Hemothy right that he was yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah. he made it well. Uh, Justin Timberlake had just come out I believe maybe a year before Confessions came out yeah. with. Uh, I forgot the name of the album. Why can't I think of it? Justify. Justify. And I, I, I heard. I don't know if you, if you know about this. I don't even know if this is a fact, but but it just makes all the sense to me, right? I believe Justify was it came out. And it was a dope album, right? So it's it's for real. It was dope. It was a dope album. And then I believe Usher was like, "We we got to come harder than this." You know what I'm saying? Like he had to think that, right? You know what I'm saying? I had to. You know, so when he came out and he did that, and I believe Justin Timberlake and Usher had this obviously mutual respect for one another. It's almost when you go back to the MTV Awards when they were dancing with Michael Jackson and they were having like the little, it was almost like a little Michael Jackson dance off. Who's a bigger Michael Jackson fan? Oh, yeah, dance yeah, off. Yeah. So this is around that same timeline. This is just my thoughts. I don't know yeah, if this, yeah. anybody else peeped this. So you have the Justified album, then you have Confessions. Confessions, in my view, was better than Justified. But then, I, should, I mean, uh, Justin comes out with Future Sex Love Sounds like two, two years later. You know what I'm saying? Like, when I think about them two as artists, I think about Justin, I think about Usher. Both, to me, just like through the roof, super talents, great singers, great right. artists, performers, the whole deal. From the Michael Jackson tree, right? Do you consider, first of all, do you consider Justin an R&B artist? That's first. Yes. Uh, I don't think R and B just like like what we said before, Hall yeah. of Notes. That's R and B. That's Kenny right. Loggins. R and B. That's right. That's right. Michael McDonald. You know what I'm saying? That's right. It's like it, it it's it's no, you know, 
R and B is R and B. You can't attach it to a group. That's right. That's right. You know, it's a sound. It's a it's feeling. It's a sound. It's a feeling. Yeah. And either you got it or you don't. That's right. That's right. Right. Yeah. So, so Justin. So Justin's R and B. This is for all the people I'm having a conversation with. Some people's like, "Oh, Justin's not R and B." I'm like, "Boy, what? That boy is just as R and B as anybody else." Like Justin is. Right. He is. He is the epitome of that. So. Who do you think has the and we're we gonna get to your fifth favorite artist, fifth, uh, fifth favorite uh, album? Well, you try. said it already, so oh. well, yeah. Which what? Which what? Future Sex Rosa? Future Sex. If I had the Future Sex of twenty twenty. Okay, okay. Both because, of them albums are crazy, but they're crazy because uh, I mean, uh, you got to look at the people behind it as well. The artists so, themselves are, of course, that's dope, and the songwriters, right? So what? Twenty twenty. That's uh, James Fonda, right? James Fonda. Big shots. Dude, is he just different, bro? He's yeah. just different. Apparently, yeah. I've I've heard that from like when I was at now. I, I was telling you how I met Tim and Bob, and 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 uh, well, I can't think of his name. Who we just said? What? Uh, um, oh, Teddy Riley. Teddy Riley. Yeah. And Tim and Bob at at Nam. Yeah. Also met Benjamin Wright. They introduced me to Benjamin Wright. Nice. Benjamin Wright. All right. Benjamin Wright okay. is one of the background powerhouses for nice. writing strings and orchestrations. Oh, All of Michael Jackson's strings, he wow. did. And so for the 2020 album era, yeah. and even Justin Bieber, they tapped Benjamin Wright to write the strings. And Benjamin oh, Wright wow. even said, you know who the bad mother James Fauntleroy. And I didn't I didn't know nothing about James Fauntleroy. I, I have one James Fauntleroy story. I don't know him at all, but I met him one time. I want to meet him. And James, you're more than welcome to come to the Can We Talk r &B podcast. I'm a huge fan of you, brother. I am in Los Angeles at a industry party, and we were at the Four Seasons. Uh, this is maybe 2019, uh, summer 2019, and uh, it's everybody's in there. Everybody, right. you like, so we just everybody's in there, just kind of moving around, dab dab, whatever, whatever. And then I see this guy comes in. He has his chains on. He's like he he looks like seafood. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he looks like a he looks like a black seafood. He comes in there. Uh, and he just walk around like this. Like, he just knows he the shit. Like, he's like, I, I know I'm shit, but I'm high as I'm lit as whatever. They just walk around. Wow. And he just smiling. Super cool. And I, I'm talking to someone else. I saw him. I'm like, oh, actually, my boy Van actually introduced me to him. He's like, oh, he, he dapped him up. He said, oh, this is Virginia. I said, oh, I know exactly who you are. I just dapped him up. I said, bro, I'm a big fan. He was like, I said, man, I would love to work with you. And he just gave me like the little Hollywood nod. I don't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we didn't exchange information, but. That was a cool interaction. That's my only story with him. But dude is just different. Yeah. So he, I know he was behind 2020. Was he on Future Save Love Songs as well? I'm not sure. Because they went crazy. They went crazy on that album as well. They did too. I, I love that album because it, it kind of pushed the limits. It pushed the boundaries. Sure. Not the limits, but the boundaries. Sure. That people were constrained in R&B. And it's Absolutely. like, no, you can have these extended cuts. That's right. And actually flip it. That's in the middle right. and ride it out. Four you, know minutes, you got four and minutes vibe and that's jump straight to another R&B was, though. Like, right. Earth, Wind, and Fire in the, the 70s and whatnot. Yeah. That's how R&B was. It's like a, a lot of ride out type of stuff, just vibes. You know what I'm saying? I and, felt like they tapped into, like, it was like Prince vibes. Remember, the, like, the, in the 80s, they had those, yeah. those, those synth strings. Yeah. yeah. And then all that stuff on top of, like, the way they came and Timbaland just went, bananas on the on the uh, percussion production i'm sorry across the board right with those projects so those are strong so we got you said uh stevie wonder which was uh which music query music query yeah. you had uh a rap rap from anita, anita baker then i went never say never never say never Confession. professions and then it's it's out of future sex I, i'm gonna say future sex future sex love sound okay that's a that's a strong five that's a strong yeah. five okay okay yeah. i got one last and then we actually went um, well, you mentioned Stevie Wonder, and Stevie is to me the unadulterated goat. Unadulterated, period. Like he is the goat. Goat now, goat of goats. The goat of goats. <laughs> right, right. So like, if all of them, if there's a bunch of goats, he's Billy. Okay, right, right. You know I mean? The so, original goat. That's right. So when I think about Stevie, there's a section of uh, that we want to talk about. So. Um, it's called respect the pin game, right? Okay. So when I think about it, I think about basically the way it's set up. So we listen to, I mean, I listen to so much music and I'm thinking about all the different songs and I, and what I really, really appreciate about 
R and B is the lyrical, you know, mm -hmm. when, when, you know, the lyrical facets of the writing, right? So it's right. not just writing something that sounds good or against melody, but it's like really when you're telling the story. And you know, I think about this for today, and it's funny you mentioned uh, you mentioned Stevie Wonder as it's like one of my favorite, mm -hmm. one of my favorite Stevie Wonder it songs of all time. To do so I wanted to tap into like a little bit, like from the ly our lyrical side. Okay. of uh of that song and we don't have to get too deep into all the lyrics of it because it's, it's a it's a wordy song but when i you know normally we just pull one line and we just break that one line down okay. but when i think about this i'm like you know stevie wonder on ass he says until the rainbow burns the stars out in the sky i'll wait wow. until the ocean covers every mountain high always you know until the dolphin flies and parrots live at sea. Always. Until we dream of life and life becomes a dream. So, uh, come on, man. Stevie, like, Stevie's in another universe. Like, he just is in another universe. And when I break them, these lyrics down, you're just basically saying, like, until the rainbow burns, you already know that's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. So... That's right. Always. Always. I'm going to be loving you. You know what I mean? Always. My like, gosh. you know. They Wow, that's commitment. <laughs> that's, oh, that's, com that's, com <laughs> that's commitment. That's uh, commitment. I just want to give a shout out to my wife, baby always. Baby always. Listen, until the ocean covers every mountain high. Now, I f as a songwriter, I'm always aspiring to, you know, to get to, you know, I feel like I've written some really strong songs, but I'm always trying to, I feel like I'm trying to reach this other pinnacle, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, I'm always trying to, you know, I'm listening to guys like Stevie Wonder, greats like, you know, Diane Warren, or, or, you, or you have, uh, you know, of course, Babyface, um, right. you know, Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis. Like, these guys are just, like, the songwriters of more than an era. Like, right, I mean? like, right, absolutely. And we, when we look at it written, you know, these guys, in my view, in my view, are up there with John, the Paul, the Matthew. <laughs> The guys who the the the, the 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 apostles who wrote the right. gospels. That's right. right that's right, how right. great they write. You know what I mean? So you know, as a songwriter, like what's your, like if you if you think about your favorite lyric from um, or if you have one off the top of your head, like a favorite line from any of those artists. Do you have um not any of those artists specifically, but your favorite R and B artist, like favorite, favorite song? Um, I mean, it's so so many good lyrics or what have you. Um, but one that's, that stood out and always stands out to me. Is rain, SWV rain. Come on. Oh my God. I mean, full as a damn at capacity, my passion is about to explode. Yeah, I can't escape it surrounding me. I'm caught in a storm that I don't need no shelter from. What's funny is uh, on the first episode, I picked that song. Oh, you picked that song? But it's great <laughs> because every time I break it down, I'm just like, come on. Like, first of all, Coco, big shout out to Coco. Right. I didn't know you was going to say that. We talked about Coco a little earlier as a phenomenal singer. Right. But uh, Brian Alexander Morgan wrote that. This dude is out of here. You know what I mean? He's out of here. So that song, that's funny that you said that. That's, I put that song, I put Rain as, I don't want to rank it in terms of like saying it's, it's, it's one of the best R&B songs, period. It's one of them. It's probably... I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna just throw a throw a percentage out there. It's top ten R&B songs in the last thirty years. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think what what make also stand out so much is the melody of it. Exactly, because the melody and the chorus structure is jazz. It comes from Jaco Pastorius. Mm -hmm. You know, he played that melody on the bass. That that whole progression, the melody mm -hmm. in the chorus doom, doom. on the bass, and it's such jazz type of progression. Because it's not in one tonal scenario, you know, it's right. not like in one mode or yeah. what have you. Gotcha. It's it's pure jazz. It's like changes. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so just adding that in the context with the lyric, like just brings it to a whole nother level. Now, I didn't realize, I mean, you can feel that, you know right. what I'm saying? But I don't know if I even broke it down like that. But every time I break that song down, I'm writing something new. Just from a musical standpoint, I'm always floored by it. But yeah. man, that's fantastic. Man. Well, bro, this is a continued conversation. I I'm hope so. so. Listen, for sure. <laughs> I am so, fun. so excited and happy that you came. I appreciate man, you. I appreciate them. Bro. Blessing us, man. Yeah, man. Look, we're going we gonna, we gonna to keep the message going. Can we talk R&B? 
Look, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Big shout out to my man, Tick to the Talk, AKA, well, not AKA, he is Tick to the Talk, but his biological, uh, what the hell I'm talking about? His government, all that, Mr. Dominic Bazil. Y'all check him out. He is amazing. Follow him on social at Tick to the Talk. At Tick to the Talk everywhere. You can find me at Tick Tick to the the Talk. Check him out. God bless y'all. We appreciate y'all. What's up, what's up? It's your boy, Ian Vaughn. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to Can We Talk R&B. And uh, if you like this episode, please subscribe. Hit the button below. Subscribe to us. God bless.